Now, your dad passed away at, at a young age. You were obviously very young. Uh, tell us a little bit how that really changed your life, uh, you know, in a, in a really major way. Well, I was 14 years old when my dad passed on, and uh, just before he did leave this life, uh, we had a series of man-to-man -man talks. He knew he was in the process of checking out, so uh, he put me in this humongous leather chair he had, which was dad's chair, you know. And he told me what he called uh, about the pitfalls of life. And uh, I remember those talks to this day. Uh, he gave me his slant, his philosophy on uh, what it is to be a decent human being, and uh, he really uh, was very proud to be an American. He, uh, he used to uh, tell me that it was a responsibility for me to project an image to the world uh, that, as those of you that knew Richard Dix, the actor, Throughout the world, he was known as the American movie star, and uh, in that respect, a, an ambassador for uh, an example of uh, how to be an American man in those days. Now, um, I know we all know that that image has changed. <laughs> I mean, just a tad. Yeah, right. Uh, they didn't have spiked hair back there. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, there was a responsibility uh, that went along with stardom that he took very seriously. And he was most grateful to uh, people. I just had the pleasure of, of uh, visiting with Ernie Borgnine on a set that he is now shooting a movie called Nightclub. And it's a very interesting format, you know. It's a, Ernie Borgnine still working at 93, by yeah, the way. Right. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. And there were uh, a lot of the elderly uh, folks in this actual uh, rest home, which was being used as a location. And they're in wheelchairs and stuff, you know. And, uh, and Ernie and I came out of this room, which was his, uh, you know, his dressing room area, walked out into these people, I must have been 15 or 20 of them, and they all said, Marty! <laughs> and, you know, uh, he is a good example of, of a man who's so appreciative. He even told me that he and a, uh, traveled all over the United States in a motorhome. That's right. Just to meet his fans. That's uh, right. That's because right. he's so grateful. That's right. And that's the way my dad was also. Did your dad, uh, before he did pass on, did he know that you were going into acting, or did that come later, after his time? Well, actually, he told my mother, don't let the boys get in the racket. <laughs> uh, he didn't want me to become an actor. Uh, he felt uh, that it was full of pitfalls, and of course I learned it was right about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I learned it was always chicken or feathers. And, but uh, it, it uh, on the other side of the coin, I personally have had a very, very interesting uh, 30 years or so in the movie industry until I became an active in the middle to late 70s. Uh, because the stories got such that, frankly, I, the ones that were being submitted to me, I didn't want to be part of. And, uh, Therefore, I, and plus I had some business interests for the family that I right. had to take care of. But, uh, you know, I've seen a great deal of the world, and uh, I must say, every place I've been, including Taiwan and Hong Kong and Europe, uh, people loved and respected my father's work. So, it's been a great privilege to be his son and to meet people that loved him all over the world. You actually signed on near the the last, uh, what I would call the last gasp of the studio system, and you uh, signed on MGM in the 50s, and uh, were in, you appeared in a number of notable movies, including the great sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet. 
Crewman yes. uh, Gray. Yeah, Crewman Gray here, <laughs> Forbidden Planet. Uh, what was what were those days like? Uh, you know, LP Mayer had left the studio. Um, they still had the musicals that were in vogue for a while. The television was encroaching. What were your days like as a contract player at Metro? Well, first let me say, television just frightened the, all the studio heads. You know, they they were sure that no audience would ever go back to a movie again. And so they downsized every studio in town, which meant that those of us that were under contract to the studios at the time became what is known in the Hollywood terms as a freelance actor. <laughs> so the one wonderful thing about the, the studio system was that you had some job security. Right. And you would, yes, you were a property of the studio, but you still knew that uh, 50 out of the 52 weeks a year that you'd be getting your paycheck, which would be meager maybe to some of the salaries that you could get as a freelance, but you also had some job security. So, uh, but I was most appreciative because uh, though I had gone through the National Academy of Theater Arts in Pleasantville, New York, it was a stage experience that I brought to MGM when they put me on the contract and they gave me the opportunity to learn how to work in front of a camera, to find key light and find your mark and the various different mechanics of working in front of a camera. Uh, the studio put me into small parts at first and all the rest of us that were under contract at that time, Richard Anderson, mm -hmm. uh, James Drury became the Virginian, right. uh, Earl Hollerman, uh, there were just a slew of us that were given little larger, little better parts until, including Roger Moore, my dear friend 007 Roger, oh, yes. you know, uh, he and I are still dear friends this day, many, many years later. So uh, it was a training ground that uh, today I think is missing for a lot of young actors and actresses that want to uh, become active in the, in the craft. Uh, they don't have that artistic boot camp mm -hmm. <laughs> right. to go through and, uh, and learn about this industry. I was always a snoop. I, I wanted to know <laughs> about sound and camera and makeup and wardrobe and mm -hmm. the electrician and the various different people and their jobs and what they were doing. And uh, that helped me transition into the independent production field mm -hmm. where I co-produced and uh, acted in, worked in front of and behind the camera as well. And uh, when we did that, we were mavericks because the studio systems were the, were, were the varsity players in Hollywood and we were just uh, an annoyance, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, we did produce movies for uh, small budgets and uh, and you can see, if you have a good actor, you can have a story that's not the best in the world. You know, I was trying to think, I said, well, come up here, I just bumped my head, I can't remember who I am, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if an actor is uh, as polished as my father was, he can take a story that uh, is not the greatest. No. And uh, still give you, give you those believable moments. So it's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Bob, it has been great having you. And uh, your book, I did uh, read Bob's book, and it is very, very well written and brutally, brutally honest about not only his dad, but his own life. And I found it fascinating, and I highly recommend it. Very good. And thank you so much for coming. And we've got another Whistler movie coming up. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.